Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Whether you're joining us in our interactive webinar platform or on our YouTube stream, or perhaps viewing this as a recorded session, we are so thrilled that you're here. Today's session on landlord-tenant protections for military members is part of our PCS series hosted by the Personal Finance Concentration Area of the MFLN. Throughout today's session, we hope that you'll join us in conversation via the chat pod to the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Thank you to those of you who have taken the time to say hello and let us know where you're joining us from. Also, please note the Military Families Learning Network link in the event info, info pod to the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This link will connect you to the webinar slides, handouts, and other event materials available in support of today's event. If you need tech support at any time during today's webinar, simply send us an email at milfamln at gmail.com. This email address is also located in that event info pod. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families, and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through an innovative online programming. I'll now turn the mic over to Molly Herndon, who is the Program Coordinator for the MFL and Personal Finance Team, to introduce today's topic as well as our presenter. Molly? Thank you, Coral. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Ms. Be Mary Benzinger. Since 2011, Ms. Benzinger has served as the Senior Attorney for the U.S. Army at the Pentagon Army and Air Force Legal Assistance Office. Ms. Benzinger is a frequent lecturer on many legal issues of concern to service members, including family law, family support and custody, estate planning, service mem members' civil relief act, landlord-tenant issues, and the Uniformed Services Former Spouse Protection Act. We're pleased to have her with us here today, and I will now turn things over to Ms. Benzinger. Thank you so much. Hey, good morning, and thank you, Molly, and thank you also, uh, uh, Coral and Carrie and the MFLN for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Nice to see so many people aboard. Um, let's get started. Hit the right button. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> and the usual disclaimer applies. Uh, the opinions expressed today are mine. They are not those of the Department of the Army or the Department of Defense. And this is not intended to be a substitute for legal advice. It's just uh, designed to uh, make you more aware of some of the issues and, and planning uh, thoughts for real estate terminology, leasing, uh, and some of the documents you may encounter. Please, state laws vary greatly. Uh, be sure to check your state law before relying on anything that I may have in this presentation for you. Okay, uh, brand new. Uh, a couple days ago, I was online and up popped something called the Tenants Bill of Rights. Uh, the four services, four branches have gotten together and they're preparing a joint tenant bill of rights in an effort to ensure that service members and their families have safe, quality homes and communities uh, and make clear what their rights are when they're living in privatized housing. Uh, the tenant's bill of rights is going to be enforced through renegotiating leases with privatized housing companies, uh, and it's going to be implemented in the coming weeks. So this is literally hot off the presses. So here's some of the highlights. This is the bullet points that this is going to cover. Uh, it's going to cover uh, safety and health. Uh, they have a right to reside in homes that are safe, meet environmental standards, have working uh, functioning appliances and things like that. There's going to be a housing advocate now uh, as designated by the installation's chain of command. There's going to be professional property management services that meet or exceed industry standards. Uh, tenants are going to have the right to uh, convenient methods of ways to communicate with the landlord and with the maintenance departments. They're entitled to prompt repairs. Uh, there's going to be a dispute resolution or mediation or arbitration set up to um, enable <clears throat> the disputes to be effectively arbitrated or resolved. Uh, specific move-in, move-out procedures. Uh, there's going to be privacy uh, notices to permit people to uh, not have landlords and their maintenance crews pop in unannounced. 
there's going to be provisions for rent payments uh, to be withheld from the landlords if there's uh, true disputes between them while the disputes are being reconciled, uh, predictable rent, there's going to be a, a notices of any fees that may be charged, and there's not going to be any more reprisal things. So if, it, if, a, if a tenant complains about government housing to staff or the chain of command, there's not going to be any reprisals. So this is coming out. Keep your eyes peeled. Uh, that should be out and in effect in a couple of weeks. Okay, in, in your uh, state, wherever you live, there may very well be some form of statutory landlord tenant act. Uh, if you uh, know what that is, um, I'm going to pop over quick and answer a question here. Uh, will this be applicable to post housing as well, since they are mostly contracted housing now? Uh, any privatized housing, anything that's, that's by contract with the government is going to be covered by this Tenant Bill of Rights, as I understand it. Uh, it's it's a privatized housing companies um, specific, so uh, that's what I know right now. Uh, that may change, but I think that's where they're they're directing this. Does that hope that answers your question, Jacqueline? Uh, back to the landlord tenant act. Um, Depending on where your state, what your state does, some states have a mandatory landlord tenant act. It applies to every single lease. Uh, some states have one that the landlords and the tenants can opt out of. This varies by state, but you should know what happens in your state. Um, they usually set forth specific duties of the landlord and the tenants for issues like repairs and how rent is paid, maybe notices. Uh, dealing with mold, security deposits, kind of a wide array of of issues. Uh, these can be very extensive, they can be very detailed. You should have an idea what yours says. Well, this may seem obvious, um, <laughs> but trust me, it's not. If uh, your service member is, is going to select a um, property, uh, please counsel them not to do it sight unseen. Uh, I know we are a, a technologically adept society now and everything is YouTubed and, and videoed and FaceTimed and all that stuff, but there really is no substitute for seeing it in person. I can't tell you how many people I've had come into my office and say, it looked great on the video, but boy, was it a mess. Or it was supposed to have something, and it's not there. So I understand that some people have no choice. They're coming from Germany or from Korea. Um, but it's not ideal. Okay, This is fraught with peril. Uh, it's never the same thing as when you see it in person. Uh, and I realize some of our folks are still going to do it. Uh, but it is not. it should not be the default. Again, something that may also be obvious, uh, read the lease. Uh, I, clients come in here all the time and say, well, it says right here how you do this. Did you read it? No. Well, that's a problem. Um, recently had someone come in here and decided to terminate their lease early and didn't bother to read the early termination clause and was shocked to find that they were liable for two months' rent. Uh, there was a way to do it to avoid that, and they didn't do it. So that's a problem. I mean, there's only so much we in legal can fix, but uh, read before you sign. If you don't understand it, if there's something you don't get, uh, that's why you know bases have legal assistance. Uh, encourage your folks to go to legal assistance. We'll go through it paragraph by paragraph with them, and so they 100% understand what they're signing, um, especially if they're first-time tenants, and especially if they've got one of these massive commercial leases that are legal sized and incredibly thick and and in ten point type, so uh, happy to review it with them. Uh, a little bit like buying a car, uh, they shouldn't be pressured into signing something. If the rental housing people say, you know, this is only good for today, you have to sign today, or you don't get whatever deal it is they're giving them. Um, that's usually a warning sign that, that they're putting too much pressure um, um, 
on the tenant. Uh, somebody popped a question in here and says, my understanding is that legal only review unsigned leases. Is that correct? Uh, that's not true here. Um, I, I look at leases all the time. When people come in with a problem, they've already signed a lease. Uh, I'm happy to look at that and see what the, it, whether the problem they're having is solvable. Really, you can't give anyone advice on a landlord-tenant issue without seeing the lease signed or unsigned. Um, I don't have any problem re reviewing signed leases. That may vary. I mean, the, the different branches have different rules, and sometimes different offices will um, will have different rules on whether they'll whether their legal team will review certain documents. I never have a problem looking at anything. Uh, if it's unsigned, great. Let's look through it. Make sure you understand what you're signing. If you've already signed it and you have a question about something that's going wrong with your apartment, then we can read the lease with you and, and, and see what's going on. Um, yes, it is uh, installation specific. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the, and I, I have tenants all the time that say, well, they were pressured into signing it. Uh, well, you know, it's like, like I said, it's like buying a car. Um, you have to be willing to walk away. I mean, there's lots of apartments typically uh, don't sign up for something that, that doesn't quite feel right. Uh, promises. Promises. See a lot of, of folks who were promised uh, something like an extra parking space or free months access to the gym or pool, extra pool passes, those sorts of things. Uh, and then they sign the lease and they go to get whatever other free goodie they were promised only to be told, well, that's not in your lease and you don't have an addendum and, and without that you're not getting it. So again, this is one of the things you have to be careful of. Every lease has something called an integration clause. And it basically says that the only agreement that controls in this lease is whatever is written on this lease, that there are no outside deals, promises, handshakes, whatever. Uh, if it's not on the lease, in the lease, or it is on an addendum, then it's not going to be an enforceable promise. So uh, this happens all the time. Again, trying to force people to uh, or encourage people to sign leases quickly. Um, you know, here's your free month at the gym, and it turns out, well, you know, the salesman didn't have authority to offer you that. So uh, again, uh, read the lease uh, and be careful about extra promises. Uh, typically, the lease starts out with identifying the premises. Um, what property is being rented? This may sound obvious, but you know, they need to be sure that the property address and the apartment number, if any, are the correct one. Uh, I've seen people sign leases thinking they were getting you know, apartment 206 when they had suddenly signed up for 207. Uh, they're very different apartments. I mean, they face a different direction. Uh, again, things to be careful of. Uh, these are these are binding contracts, and a lot of our soldiers have never had to sign a binding contract like this before. And it's full of legalese, and it doesn't make sense. And uh, you know they are trusting the salesman's word on this, and maybe they shouldn't. Uh, some of this is is life experience. Uh, you know, especially our younger soldiers get bur get burned by these. Um, but it, again, these are some some simple things to do uh, to make sure that you're actually getting the right property. How long are you renting it for? What's the lease term? Um, usually the lease will say one year, two years, three years, whatever. Um, it may also state how much notice you have to give at the end of the lease so that the lease doesn't automatically renew. Uh, everybody assumes that, oh, I just have to give 30 days notice to get out of this lease at the end of the lease term. That may not be so. Uh, many leases now say that it needs to be Six, at least 60 days to renew if you want to renew. Uh, some of them have automatic renewals on them, and that's one, one distinction you need to know. Have you signed up for an automatic renew? So you have a one-year lease, and it says if no one tells anyone anything, it automatically renews for another year. So you got to be a little careful about that. Uh, make sure, you, again, you understand what you're signing up for. And even with the auto-renew leases, Typically, they say something like, if you're not going to auto-renew, then you have to provide a landlord notice 
uh, 60 days, for example, in advance of the, of the, the date the lease is going to expire, whether you're going to continue or not. Okay. How much rent are you going to pay? You know, usually the lease will say this. <laughs> Sometimes, believe it or not, it doesn't. I've seen leases where that particular block was completely blank uh, because someone forgot to fill it in. Uh, this is a problem. But how much rent is supposed to be paid? Is that what you agreed to? Uh, where are you supposed to pay it? What's the due date? What's the acceptable form of payment? Can you give them cash downstairs? Do you need, can you pay with cash? Do you need a check? Can you direct deposit or money order? Um, and uh, the lease may also address like proration for a partial month if you're moving in uh, uh, early. So at the end of your lease term, one of the things you need to watch out for um, is your, your rent may say, this rent provision may say, uh, at the end of the lease, uh, the next year's rent will go up by 10% or will go up by $500 a month. Uh, so that's something to consider also uh, when you're looking at whether to renew your lease or not. Thanks for the question, Mark. This is what's happening more and more, um, and it's it, it's a little bit tricky. Is is late payments and return checks? Okay, um, folks are um, using their bank account to the bill pay on your bank account. When you use bill pay on your bank account, if it's not like direct wired, what bill pay actually does is it mails a check to the person you bill pay. So if you do that on the first of the month, uh, that's great, but the bank is going to take a couple days to process that check, and they put it in the mail, and it's mail mails to your landlord, and it shows up late. And the landlords don't like that. And so the landlord is going to get on the tenant about it being late, and they're going to try to invoke late fees or return check fees if, it, if it's a bouncer. Uh, but at least a late fee, which can be kind of annoying and sometimes sort of expensive after a while. And the solution is, uh, and, and the tenant's always shocked, well, you know, I set up the bill pay for the first, not understanding that bank bill pay generates a check. It does not direct deposit unless you have set, it, set something up to direct deposit. So... Uh, that's something you have to be really, really careful of. Uh, and they, a lot of folks can't understand, well, I paid it on the first. Well, how did you pay it? Uh, well, I did bill pay through my bank. Well, then all they did was mail them a check on the first. And your landlord's not getting it till between the 5th and the 8th of the month. That's why you're getting a late fee. So set something else up. Uh, most landlords will do direct deposit. Um, and, and that's just a clean way to do it. There's no reason not to do direct deposit. Um, you know, get that set up so that it, it's it. When you push the button on the first of the month, the landlord's got the money on the first of the month, and then you don't run into any problems. Uh, don't rely on on snail mail to uh, do the job for you. You're you're asking for trouble, and that you're going to get some some late fees, and everybody's going to get annoyed. So, uh, to the best of your abilities, do uh, electronic. The other thing that's happening a lot is. Um, that when you have uh, a portal, some of these big landlords and with big with management companies have a payment portal. Um, there's a little bit of a problem with those too. I've got someone now that's having a problem with that, where they're going online and paying on the portal, uh, but the portal documents and the lease documents they sign say that there's like a three to five day lead time when you pay through the portal. So, you know, don't think that the portal is like a direct deposit because it may not be. It may be one of these, you know, electronic check kind of things also. So you really have to read your documents. You know, that's sort of the bottom line is my, my client's getting burned right now because she thinks there's a five-day uh, period, and in fact, there's not. She has to pay on the first or it's late, and the portal is not, it, it's got a five, three to five-day delay on it, I think. All right, so what happens if you don't pay rent on time? 
uh, usually either your landlord tenant act or mostly your um, your lease is going to say what happens um, in uh, depends on what state you're in, but a lot of states have something like a five-day notice to pay or quit. So if you're late, the landlord's going to give you a, a, a notice, you know, taped to your front door or served by the sheriff that says you got five days to pay up or get out. Um, so what that allows the t landlord to do is if you don't pay within that five-day window or 20-day window, whatever your, your state statute says, uh, the landlord may terminate the lease, which means the lease is over and you're going to be out. Um, it, there's a problem with that. and Some tenants don't care. They move out and they think all's well, only to find out that they're responsible for rent for each month the place is vacant. Some states do not require landlords to, to make an attempt to re-rent. In other words, to mitigate their damages, there's no requirement. They can sit there and let that lease just clip away, uh, and the tenant is responsible for each month that place is vacant. Now, most landlords have good common sense, and they try to get it re-rented, but for as long as it takes to get that place re-rented, uh, the tenant's on the hook. And, and the classic example is, you know, tenants that leave uh, in the middle of November when the landlord's just not going to be able to get anybody into that place until at least February probably because of the holidays and things like that, you know, they're going to be on the hook for a couple months of rent. So um, that's something that some tenants just don't seem to get a grip on is that once they're out, that doesn't mean their, their obligation to uh, continue to pay rent until the, uh, until the lease expires technically, but until the landlord typically finds someone else to, to fill the void. Uh, most leases have something called a truthful application provision. Um, it, it, it just covers the landlord a little bit. It says if the landlord finds out that the tenant's lied in the application, they can terminate the lease and, and evict the tenant. And you find this for things like people who lied and, and they're really on the sex offender registry and they didn't, they didn't tell the, the, the landlord, um, or they lied about their employment when they did an employment check on them. There, there's some material misrepresentation that the landlord relied on uh, on the application to rent to the tenant. Uh, if the landlord finds out that there's been a lie, they can they can uh, evict you. Um, a couple of ones I've seen also is uh, uh, applying for the lease and not saying that your brother's really going to live there with you, um, or that you, you're leasing it primarily for your brother to live in and you're going to live someplace else. Uh, that is not going to go over uh, very well with the landlord. Another thing you're going to see in leases a good bit is uh, uses. What can, you, what can a tenant use their pro the property they're leasing for? Uh, typically, it's only as a single family residence. Uh, it's not meant for multiple occupants. Uh, and oftentimes, the landlords will put in the lease or an addendum to the lease the name of the occupants that will be residing in the property. Uh, typically, there's no subletting without the landlord's permission. Uh, if you have house guests, uh, oftentimes there's a cap on that. They can only be there two weeks. You know, your sister can't move in with you for the duration uh, without letting the landlord know. I've had clients run into problems with this. Well, you know, my sister and her husband broke up and she moved in with me uh, and the landlord just found out about it. Now he wants to increase the rent uh, because of it. Uh, so there's problems inherent in that uh, a lot of times the tenant doesn't understand that you know, once they've rented this thing, it isn't their property to do with whatever they want. Uh, they got to keep usually noise and nuisances down to a dull roar. You know, no illegal activity. Uh, they can't be, you know, running the, the crack den out of the out of the house um, and things like that. Uh, typically, there's smoking restrictions. Uh, most most uh, properties are no smoking now. Uh, if you're going to have a pet. Uh, then you need to make sure that your pet uh, is disclosed to the landlord. Uh, a couple of cases where you know, the tenant moved in and had three dogs and didn't bother to tell the landlord, uh, and that doesn't go over too well. So um, make sure that the, the pets are disclosed. Uh, and usually the landlord has a right to terminate this lease for, for those kinds of violations um, and, and will. All right, pets in particular, uh, again, tell your landlord if you're going to keep some pets. 
uh, some uh, landlords and some large apartment buildings especially have a very strict restrictions on what kind of uh, breed of dog you may have. Uh, things that are excluded are things like, you know, uh, uh, carnocorsies, those big, huge things that bite, um, Doberman pinchers, uh, pit bulls. A lot of those things are not welcome. Uh, certain size dogs uh, are not uh, welcome a lot. Uh, and there may be a certain number. You may only have one dog or two dogs. Um, you cannot have four or five. Uh, typically, uh, you have to put a, down a pet deposit um, of some sort and a fee, um, and the lease should say whether that pet deposit is refundable or not. Uh, some of them are not because uh, pets have a certain amount of wear and tear on a property, and a lot of the times the landlord is just willing to uh, keep your security deposit knowing that there's likely to be damages and just uh, rather than fight about that later, we'll just um, uh, just keep this, the pet deposit. So, folks need to know whether that's whether that's um, refundable or not. Uh, a service animal is not a pet. I uh, went round and round on this not too long ago, where the landlord said, "Hey, wait a minute, uh, you got a dog? Uh, yeah, I have a dog. It's a service animal. Uh, prove it." Uh, that gets a little touchy. Uh, my client was very um, circumspect about needing a service animal. We didn't like that being advertised to the world. It was a small dog, um, and she was a registered service dog. You know, she had little papers and stuff like that. She was a legit. She got it from a legitimate source. It wasn't just you know make believe service animal, uh, no service peacock or anything like that. Um, but if it's a legitimate service animal, it is not a pet. Uh, I would certainly disclose that to a landlord that you have a service animal. Uh, they obviously can't discriminate against someone that has a service animal uh, because it is not a pet. And there is never a deposit required if it's a service animal. Um, now, and I'm, I'm not all that well versed on that. Maybe some of all you all have run into this, but the uh, there's no like official registration of service animals. There's no like central licensing or anything like that. There's organizations that provide these service animals, and they're considered legitimate service animals. Uh, but there really is no, uh, you know, central licensing of service animals. So uh, sometimes the challenge to the to the whether the service animal is legitimate or not is it, it can be a little little odd, especially when the, the client's like, look, you know, it's a legitimate service dog. I I shouldn't have to prove it. I don't have to tell him what's wrong with me, do I? You know, that sort of stuff. It, you can see where some of this gets messy if the landlord decides to put up a stink about it. But uh, in, in those cases, I, I what I've done is uh, I've gotten the county involved. Uh, sometimes your counties are going to have a, a landlord tenant um, liaisons or ombudsmen or something like that that can intervene in these kinds of landlord-tenant disputes uh, and resolve them sort of amicably. So if you have those uh, a county uh, landlord-tenant office, uh, it's a good idea to know what that resource is. Uh, this one catches people off guard a great deal. Homeowners associations, condos, um, condo associations, um, uh, the lease usually says whether there's a HOA or condo. Uh, typically, the landlord, hold on a second, guys, I need to cough, and I don't want to do it in your ear. Sorry about that, guys. Um, uh, but the landlord should provide the tenant with a copy of the rules. Uh, if the landlord hasn't done that, please ask the, the tenant should ask the landlord um, because these are important. A lot of tenants get surprised by the condo association rules. Uh, for example, there could be parking restrictions. Uh, they are uh, they might need a permit to park on the premises. Uh, you may need to reserve the elevator in advance to move in. You can't just hop on and go. Uh, there may be other things like where the firewood gets placed, swing sets in the backyard. Can you park an RV in the in the driveway? 
um, can you park an RV in the apartment complex parking lot in the back? Um, seen cases where a, a guy had a um, one of those little ATV four wheel things on a trailer he parked in the in the parking lot, and that was against the uh, HOA or uh, condo association's uh, rules. So. Uh, and then tenants get all upset. I can't store my stuff. Uh, I didn't know this was going to be the case. So um, it, it's a good idea to make sure that you actually get those documents and read them, preferably before you sign your lease, so you know what kinds of restrictions are. I mean, I've had people complain because the pool only allows one guest and not five, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But this is stuff that you can uh, settle and be aware of before you sign your lease if you've read these documents in advance. Who gets to pay for the utilities? Again, this should be in the lease. Um, it should say who's responsible for which utilities. Uh, is, it, is it, you know, does the tenant pay the electric? Is that included in your rent? Um, if it's not included in your rent, uh, it, then you got to make sure you, the tenant gets those in, in their name as quickly as possible, um, so that they're they're actually paying on that. And typically, uh, when there's uh, when the tenant's responsible for some utilities and they move out, uh, the landlord oftentimes will uh, forward the final bill to the tenant for payment. If that bill isn't paid, uh, that usually comes out of the security deposit before it comes back. Okay, who does the repairs? Um, many, many a fight over this. Typically, typically the um, landlord is supposed to keep the premises in good repair. Um, if anything breaks, you know, the tenant's supposed to call the landlord. They're supposed to come fix it. Uh, some leases require a tenant to absorb the first fifty or a hundred dollars or something like that. Uh, that's kind of common, uh, but be very, very careful. There are some leases now that I've seen come by that are requiring the tenant to do all the repairs, uh, which is kind of shocking. Um, someone came in not too long ago with an unsigned, fortunately unsigned lease that required the tenant to maintain the HVAC and perform all repairs on the HVAC. Uh, that's a little excessive, but had she signed up for that, she would have been on the hook for that. So this is a very, very dangerous uh, provision. You, it needs to be read very carefully and make sure that uh, the tenant is not liable for doing all, all the repairs on the premises. I was pretty shocked by that, but, um, but apparently that's, those kinds of things are out there. Now, if the tenant, um, if the tenant uh, breaks something or the tenant, uh, you know, your four-year-old you know, flushes his sister's bunny down the toilet and the toilet clogs. Uh, those kinds of repairs are going to be on the tenant. Anything the tenant does uh, intentionally or accidentally, if it's the tenant's fault that the damages have occurred, uh, you know, your son whacks a baseball through the back window, uh, the tenant's on the hook. Uh, and usually your lease will say that. If, it's, if the repairs are required not because of normal wear and tear, but because of failure or, or fault of the tenant, uh, the tenant's on the hook. Uh, fixtures and appliances, boy, it depends on where you live. Um, it's um, usually there's, as, you know, some states you move into an apartment, there's nothing there. You're a rental house. There's no stove. There's no refrigerator. There's no microwave. You're expected to provide your own appliances. And other other states, it's it's common that the appliances just are, are just there when you move in. Um, but usually, the lease is going to say which ones the landlords are going to furnish. Uh, checklist of some sort. Uh, many times, these will say that these are as is. Uh, the checkbox will say whether it's an as is or not. Um, and and underneath that is usually something about the repair. If it's as is, you're taking it as is, and you may be subject to repair these things as they break or fail to fail to operate. Again, it can be a tiny bit dangerous depending on what the quality of the, of the uh, 
of the appliances are. If these are exceedingly old appliances um, and all of a sudden you look like you're responsible for their repair, uh, that's a problem. So some judgment has to be rendered in whether or not you want to sign something that says you're responsible for uh, repairing appliances that might be kind of old to begin with. Well, probably the biggest fight, the most common fight I see is is over the security deposit. Um, the lease will usually say how much of the security deposit needs to be paid, what it can be used for, is it going to be in an interest-bearing account. Um, your uh, Landlord Tenant Act and certainly the lease may say uh, how long after the termination of the tenancy the landlord has for uh, notifying the tenant of any damages. And, and when the money needs to be refunded after the move out, if there's anything going to be refunded. Um, it, it, the landlord can also um, use the deposit during the lease term for damages. So if, you know, if the landlord's teenager has a party and busts the house up, uh, the security deposit can be used during the tenancy to fix those damages. And then typically the landlord can demand that the um, that the security deposit be refreshed. Um, uh, somebody just posted a question about insurance. Uh, we'll get to we'll get to insurance in a second. So just hang tight there a little bit. Uh, um, let's talk about move in and move out inspections uh, in um, in as association with the security deposit. I mean, this is really a, a damages in the eye of the beholder. Um, seen a, so many cases where uh, the landlords are frankly cheap uh, and they're not looking to return any money. Um, either they don't have it to return, which is sometimes the case, uh, or they just they don't feel like they're in the business of returning the money. Uh, they fight over the paint. They fight over. Excuse me, I need to cough again. I don't want to do it. Must be spring. The pollens, pollens are born, and I can feel it. Um, every little jot and twiddle is going to get deducted. And some landlords are really cool. They say, look, this place looks super. Uh, others are just ridiculously, ridiculously picky. And things that I would think would be normal wear and tear, you know, they think are the crime of the century. And they're going to withhold uh, the security deposit. But one of the keys to um, sort of bulletproofing yourself if you're a tenant is a good move-in inspection. Um, this is where landlords get sloppy a lot is they, they, won't, they won't do a move-in inspection. They won't show up for a move-in inspection. Uh, there may or may not be a provision in your lease about a move-in inspection. Um, but I suggest to anyone who will listen to me that the move-in inspection is probably the best thing you can do for yourself. Um, I ask people to video and take pictures. And if there's anything even slightly off, um, you know, get a picture. If, if the blinds in the back are broken, you know, get a picture of that. If there's a stain on the hardwood floor, get a picture of that. Um, you've got to document when you move in what's wrong with the premises. Because if there's a stain on the hardwood floor when you move in, there's going to be a stain on the hardwood floor when you move out. And the landlord is probably going to try to make you pay for it. So now's the time to, to kind of get all this stuff in writing. Uh, if the landlord doesn't want to do a move-in inspection, I advise the, the, the tenant to, as quickly as possible, walk around that house with the most critical eye imaginable and every single little boo-boo on the wall and scuff on the floor and hole in a screen window and a crack at the door and paint rubbed off, whatever, um, get that stuff down in writing and send it to the landlord uh, and say, here's all the stuff that's wrong with the house. Uh, and it may be petty, but in the end, petty's going to count. So be as particular as you can, as thorough as you can, photograph uh, to document, write it down. If it's something that actually doesn't work, 
you know, the back burner won't light, that's something you need to tell the landlord right away. That needs to be fixed right away. Um, again, that's where you have to be a little careful with the as-is on appliances. That if they're broken when you move in, you know, this is this could be an issue for you. But but get it all written down. Um, it's There's no substitute for documentation. So when it comes time to move out and the landlord says, you know, there's a stain on the hardwood floor, you get to say, yes, and there was one when I moved in, and here's a picture of it. Gee, it's exactly the same. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that will, will protect yourself, your, your tenant, from uh, overreaching by a landlord in the end. Oftentimes, the lease has a... Um, a um, laundry list of responsibilities for the tenant. Okay, um, these include uh, the obligation to keep the place clean, uh, replacing light bulbs and fuses, uh, maintaining the tub cocking, fixing screens or broken glass, uh, replacing the furnace and AC filters. Uh, this is something that tenants fail on all the time. They leave the AC filters in for like a year. Uh, that will burn up an AC. Uh, so this is something that you know it's easy maintenance, and a lot of times the tenants won't do it. Um, there's been a wave uh, last summer, and I don't know whether there was like an article in you know the Landlord Times or what it, whatever it was that suddenly the the condition of the lawn, shrubs, weeds in the garden, that sort of thing, um, was uh, a bit suddenly a major deal. Uh, everybody that came into my office with a landlord um, was complaining about uh, the, the weeds in the gardens. Uh, you know, so apparently this is a big deal, um, and this is you know yet another way for your landlord to keep your security deposit, I guess. Uh, but the, the lawn should be maintained, and 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 part of the problem is when the when the landlord says. Um, maintain the lawn. What does that mean? Does that mean mow the lawn? Does that mean fertilize the lawn? Does that mean edge the lawn? I mean, what does maintain the lawn mean? Uh, again, photographs are important here. Uh, we spend a lot of time worrying about what the inside of the property looks like. The tenant should be cognizant of what the outside of the property looks like. Uh, again, take pictures. Um, I've had, you know, we had one period last year where it rained like nine inches in four hours. And it killed a lot of stuff. Uh, and I had one one client come in, and the you know the dogwood died in the yard, and the landlord wanted to blame the tenant. The tenant's like, I didn't do anything to it. I it just died. I you know we've had so much rain, uh, and you know it is what it is. And so there's this weird thing about maintenance, uh, and it's not very well defined. Usually just says you know maintain. Don't know what that means. Um, usually required to keep gutters clean. Uh, shovel snow and ice, that sort of thing. Pest control, you know, keep the roaches down, no mice, that sort of thing. Um, they don't want you to put signs up on the premises, so no political signs, no other signs. Um, and those are things you may have to do. Uh, and again, we've talked about this before. You know, pay for any damage, it damages that, uh, that they're the tenant's fault. So if you do something bad, you know, you've got to do it. Uh, an another thing where things get a little testy is uh, when when tenants don't um, when when tenants do stuff without asking. Um, I've had people you know hang wallpaper, paint kids' bedrooms purple. Um, you know you can't install satellite dishes. You can't put a wood stove up. Uh, a lot of tenants rekey the locks, so the landlord can't get in. That's a bad idea. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, of course, t uh, landlords have always been uh, particularly upset about people driving uh, nails and installing you know, those giant ceiling plant hooks uh, that make a big hole. And um, usually there's some kind of restriction on things that are heavy, like waterbed safes and aquariums. Uh, fortunately, waterbeds are kind of out of fashion and probably hopefully will stay that way. But they are a problem uh, for landlords because they can cause a tremendous amount of damage if they First of all, because of the weight, and second of all, because if they if they do rupture, there's an awful lot of water in one of those things. Uh, so it's a good idea to get permission from your landlord if you want to do something. You know, if you want to paint your kid's room pink, that's fine. Uh, the landlord says yes, but you got to turn it back to you know contractor beige when you leave. Fine. Uh, as much stuff in writing as possible, please. 
I've had people who said, well, you know, I just called the guy up on the phone. He said it was okay if I did it, and now I've done it, and he's mad. Well, I mean, that's why we have things in writing. So you can either do some kind of little decorator's addendum or at least have a solid email trail with your landlord that says, you know, look, we're going to paint the thing Pepto-Bismol pink. Uh, we promise to put it back to contractor beige when we're done. Uh, and the landlord writes back and says, okay, you know, put it in a file and don't lose it. All right, and make sure that uh, that that's not going to be an issue later on when somebody gets upset about the color. Okay, uh, somebody asked about insurance before. Um, more and more you're going to see leases that not only talk about renter's insurance, uh, and, and renter's insurance is for your personal effects as the tenant. So, you know, my sofa, my rug, my hutch, my uh, maybe your clothing, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, that's what renter's insurance is for. Okay, That's different from premises liability insurance. Uh, this is becoming more and more common in leases where it will say uh, the tenant is required to have, you know, $100,000 of premises liability coverage with the landlord as the named insured. And most tenants read that and go, mm, I don't know what that is. I got renter's insurance. I guess I'm okay. Well, you're not okay. Uh, and a lot of landlords are using this as an excuse to get rid of tenants they don't like uh, to say, well, where's your premises liability insurance? What do you mean you haven't had it all this time? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, you're in breach. I want you out. Uh, premises liability is sort of what, what I – think of is uh, slip and fall. So it's any time uh, e either a guest uh, is on your property, you know, your brother-in-law falls down the back stairs after having too many beers the 4th of July and tries to sue the landlord, that's what premises liability is for. If someone slips on the ice on the sidewalk uh, because you didn't get it all up after an ice storm uh, and gets hurt and tries to sue the landlord, that's premises liability. So think of it as sort of slip and fall insurance. Uh, it's relatively cheap to get, uh, so uh, usually the, the people you get your renter's insurance from know what this is. It's, this is becoming more common, but you have to be aware that that provision is probably in your lease now. It's really, really becoming common, and uh, not to forget to do it, because it also says things like, you know, if the tenant fails to do this, the, he agrees to indemnify and hold the landlord harmless from any damages, you don't want to be paying for this out of your pocket. So a uh, tenant needs to make sure that's actually done. Um, most leases have something uh, in the nature of an enforcement provision. Um, so if either party has to uh, enforce this lease or sue for breach or anything, um, uh, there's an, who, who has to pay the attorney's fees in that. Remarkably, Many leases say that the tenant has to pay the landlord for if there's a breach, but it doesn't have it the other way around. It doesn't say the landlord has to pay the tenant in the event of a breach. Um, so that should be read carefully uh, to see who's uh, shifting, how the costs are shifting, uh, and whether it's all to the landlord or whether the, the tenant is also a part of that or not. Because in, under the what's commonly called the American rule, uh, absent a contract for the payment of attorney's fees, uh, everybody pays for their own. Okay, it's um, uh, there's no uh, there's no way to shift or or assign attorney's fees without a written contract. Uh, that's why they have these provisions in in the in the lease. Okay, and they can be one-sided, so you've got to got to keep your eye open for that. Um, access to premises. Um, <coughs> tenants complain about this a lot. They they don't like people coming in and out of their house, uh, and but their lease usually says what the what the deal is, uh, and the deal is usually uh, that the landlord gets to come on uh, upon um, uh, reasonable notice. And you know what's reasonable notice? Well, that's where the fight comes in. Is reasonable notice 24 hours? Is reasonable notice, you know, two hours? Uh, I'm in your driveway. I need to get in. Is probably not reasonable notice absent an, an emergency. So for non-emergency situations, um, it's uh, uh, reasonable. Uh, good luck figuring that out. I would say that 24 hours is typically reasonable. Um, I would think more is ideal, 
but a minimum of 24 hours. Uh, someone just posted a question, isn't slip and fall coverage usually under liability in a typical renter's policy? No. Um, you have to look at uh, your, your, renter's, your renter's insurance may only be for your property only. It may not include liability. So you need to make sure that, um, that there's usually a separate liability coverage that names the landlord as the, as the, uh, uh, the named insured. So they tend to be separate. Uh, some companies might be combining them a little bit, but you need to be very careful and make sure that, that, that it's more than just uh, this personal liability, slip and fall stuff, not, not damage to your property. Uh, and that the limits are as, as you've promised in the lease. Uh, anyway, back to access to premises. Uh, typically, the landlord can can come on to make to inspect and make repairs. Uh, that means the landlord can just come over and nose around on notice. So, you know, Betty, in 48 hours, I will be at your door uh, to inspect the premises. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I can. Uh, that doesn't usually go over very well with most tenants. They don't like people sniffing around their house. But the landlord has an absolute right to do that, uh, and and they can. They can also come in to make repairs and improvements, obviously, um, and services. One of the things that gets uh, tenants annoyed is if the house is going on the market, hey, why does this guy have to put a for sale sign in my yard and a lockbox? Um, I don't want people coming in and out of my house without me being there. We have a dog. We have to secure him, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, well, your lease probably says something about that. Uh, the lease probably says that within a certain amount of time, uh, often 90 days before the expiration of the lease term, that, that, that it's perfectly okay for the landlord to put up a for sale sign or a for rent sign, and that prospective purchasers can come and go um, with um, uh, usually a reasonable notice again uh, any time before the end of the lease term. The, the problem with, with selling a property with a tenant in it is um, they – You know, the, I, I, if you've ever sold a house, um, the the uh, real estate broker calls and says, hey, "Hey, I got somebody who wants to see the house, and they want to see it now, not like tomorrow or two days from now. Now." Um, and the tenant's like, "But I got you know kids in the bathtub and the dog and the this and the that." And so there becomes this source of friction where the landlord starts threatening the tenant with, you're not cooperating with the sale. Uh, you know, if you don't start cooperating, you're in breach. And so there's this sort of lock horn kind of thing that goes on um, because it is inconvenient uh, to, to when you're selling a property to get no notice to, for people to come in. So uh, this is um, uh, just sort of the way of the world. You'll hear a lot of tenants complain about this. You'll hear a lot of landlords complain that their tenants aren't being uh, – responsive enough to the to brokers who are trying to sell the property. Um, around here, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area here, I'm sitting here in the Pentagon right now, um, we have a lot of Foreign Service folks, uh, civilian Foreign Service people. We also have a lot of federal government employees who are stationed overseas, and they own houses here in Virginia uh, or Maryland or D.C., and they have, you know, maybe gone for a year, maybe gone for two, maybe gone for three, depending on who they work for. Uh, and occasionally they are summoned home or their tour ends and they come back home. Uh, so you'll often see a, a provision for out-of-town landlords uh, who may be transferred back here. It's sort of like the Service Member Civil Relief Act for, for civilians. Uh, there is no such thing, but there's provisions in the, in the lease that look a lot like that. So um, there, there is no um, statute that I know of, and, I, and I'm not sure of every single state, but there's none that I can think of that says that, that the landlord has a right to return uh, and, and take over the property from the tenant. Uh, but these are optional provisions. You'll see them, uh, especially around areas like this where there are a lot of foreign service types and folks who deploy and, uh, as, as civilians. Uh, and it gives the landlord the right to terminate the lease if they're coming home. And it's shortish notice. It's usually like 90 days, the ones I've seen. Uh, but on 90 days' notice, the tenant is told, hey, uh, you know, we're coming back home. You need to be out by June 1st because uh, we're coming back. Um, the, the problem with that for most tenants, especially military folks, is that household goods will not move you. Um, you are about to engage in a no cost, in a cost only move to yourself. Uh, no one's going to move you. And 
military folks who usually have household goods or TMO um, uh, move them for free have no idea how painful it is to hire someone to move you and how much it costs. Uh, if you're moving an entire household of goods across town, you know, it could be 4000 bucks. This is a very pain painful thing. So uh, before you sign a lease where the landlord could come back on you before the lease term ends or before you PCS out, you might want to think long and hard about that. Um, you know, what, talk to the landlord about what, their, what the risk looks like. Um, are they coming back? Um, are, um, do they know whether they're coming back or not? I mean, sometimes people come back unexpectedly, but know that if you have this in your lease as a tenant, that you are going to uh, potentially have to move on your own nickel. Uh, if you're a landlord who is uh, one of those civilian types who's going to be deployed overseas um, or uh, stationed overseas for a while and wants to rent a house, I mean, by all means, put one of these things in there uh, because it gives you the option to come home and come home to your own house. Okay, the Service Member Civil Relief Act, uh, you guys probably hear a lot about, uh, and certainly I do. Um, Military members can terminate a lease on PCS orders, even if there's no provision in the lease. Okay, this is a federal law. It's preemptive. It rules. It controls. It's in every lease, whether it's written there or not. So um, landlords get to abide by this, and tenants get to use it. Um, the PCS orders uh, or orders to deploy the military unit uh, is, has to be for not less than 90 days. Um, the SCRA does not define PCS orders, okay? So um, the, if you look to the joint travel regulations, uh, you'll see that PCS orders include retirement uh, and separation from the service. So if someone's ETSing uh, or retiring, that is considered a PCS order for purposes of the SCRA. Uh, the Justice Department within the last two years uh, has gone after a couple of big landlords. I think one of them was like in New Mexico or Arizona, if I remember right, or Nevada. It might have been Nevada. Uh, but if you go on the, the Justice Department website, SCRA website, uh, they went after uh, some folks who were not allowing service members to invoke the SCRA military clause for ETSing, for, for uh, not re-enlisting, having your enlistment expire. And, uh, and the Justice Department won. I had a pretty large settlement with these guys. Um, so um, be careful. Uh, some states, um, hang on a second, let me see if I cover that in another slide. I don't think I do. Uh, yeah, I do. So I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there are uh, specific rules in the SCRA that you need to follow uh, and would strongly suggest that Anyone who is in a position to invoke the SCRA because they're PCSing or they're retiring or they're ETSing, uh, go to legal. Uh, just go see legal in advance, like plenty in advance, so we can help you with the timing um, that would um, make sure you do this right. Um, uh, Carolyn, you posted a question up here: Is the military clause under the SCRA does not include if a soldier is ordered to move on post? Right. Um, uh, the Service Member Civil Relief Act doesn't cover that, but um, Virginia, for example, has its own version of the SCRA, let's call it. Uh, it's called the Early Termination um, of, of Leases for Military Service Members. And it does say in there that if you are ordered to government housing, uh, you may terminate your lease. Uh, that's not moving to government housing. That's being ordered to government housing. That's different. Uh, a lot of times I get clients in here that say, well, you know, I've been on this list for government housing at Belvoir for like two years, and my, my name finally popped, and I want to get out of my three-year lease. Uh, can I use this ordered to government housing thing? I said, well, you're not being ordered to government housing. You just you know, have come up on a list for government housing. That's not the same thing. Uh, what the Virginia statute contemplates is um, – uh, special duty stuff, where where whatever it is you do for a living, your command says, look, uh, we need you on base within you know two minutes of this office, day and night, night and day, 24/7. You can't be living 30 miles away. Um, here are your orders. You will move to government housing. 
that's being ordered to government housing. Okay? It's not just being uh, popping up on the list. Uh, this happens a lot. Okay, uh, you got to give notice, um, and like I said, they're legal in advance, so it's done right. Uh, showing up after it's done wrong uh, doesn't doesn't work so good. We've we've tried that; it, it typically fails. Uh, termination is usually made by the service member delivering a written notice of termination, a copy of the military uh, orders, or if military orders aren't available yet, because uh, some folks have a terrible time getting orders cut by their units. Uh, a letter from your commander saying, uh, you know, Sergeant Smith is going to be deploying or going to be PCSing effective September 1st, uh, orders pending. Uh, that will do it. Uh, that will do it. Uh, notice has to be delivered in writing by hand delivery, by a private business carrier like FedEx or UPS, or by certified return receipt requested in the U.S. mails, okay? Um, the FCRA doesn't say anything about texting or tweeting or anything like that. And I mean, I know we are a technologically savvy outfit now, but a lot of land, a lot of kids, especially younger soldiers, well, I, you know, I, I texted my landlord and told him I, I was PCSing, and the landlord writes back and says, later on, not good enough. You needed to follow this here. It has to be in writing, by hand, private business carrier, whatever. Uh, and we're not going to accept your notice. You know, round and round we go. So doing it right is extremely important. If you do it right, it is presumptive. Uh, you are out of this lease. You have made a proper SCRA termination, and you are done. Um, if the landlord doesn't like it, the landlord's remedy is in the SCRA. It says that the landlord can go to court and ask the court for relief as long as they do it before the termination date that you've set forth in your notice. Okay, So there's a remedy for the landlord here. Um, i got one pending right now. Uh, the Virginia SCRA, is, let's put it that way in quotes, uh, says you have to be PCSing 35 miles. My client's lease doesn't say anything about 35 miles. It reads exactly like the federal SCRA. The federal SCRA doesn't say anything about distance. It just says PCS orders. My client has PCS orders within like 30 miles. Okay? Um, and the landlord's saying it's not 35. Well, there's no requirement in the SCRA that it be 35 miles. So we're going to have a little, little fight over this. But uh, uh, be mindful that the, a lot of landlords have false assumptions about what the federal law actually says. Uh, again, that's one reason why you serve your tenant well by doing this correctly and in advance. Um, uh, there's a question popped up here about DOD civilians on PCS orders. No, um, there is, there are some um, uh, provisions of the SCRA that apply to civilians um, deployed with foreign uh, Military, but but this this one's not gonna not gonna cover you for for PCSing. It's gonna need to be in your lease. Uh, some leases have uh, termination provisions, especially the big commercial landlords and tall apartment high rises and things like that. Uh, they may have your lease may contain sort of a non-SCRA early termination clause that says you can move, uh, but we're gonna hit you for a two months rent, for example. Um, not all leases have that, but some do. Um, and um, you know, if you have to go or you know you have to go, uh, the best uh, thing to do to try to avoid that two-month penalty is give the landlord a lot of notice. Uh, uh, you're a deploying civilian, for example. Uh, I'm a deploying civilian. Um, I need to leave in August. Um, I will help you do whatever it takes to get this place rented before I go so I don't have to pay a two-month penalty. How would that work for you? Um, a lot of landlords will work with you. If it's a big high-rise, you know, they'll rent that apartment pretty quick if, it's, if you're in a busy, busy area and it's a desirable location. So 
sometimes the best policy is to be up front with your landlord and let them know you're going and see if you can uh, get it rented as quickly as possible after you vacate so you're not on the hook for two whole months. Okay. Um, the military discount thing is a tiny bit odd and, I, and to some extent uh, resolved. Uh, there, there was a time when commercial landlords um, were offering uh, rebates for service members. Um, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, we're going to give you a $200 a month uh, discount on your uh, rent. So instead of paying $1,200 a month, you'll now pay 1000 because you're such a good guy. Uh, but when you read the fine print on this, the fine print says if you early terminate, which the landlord was reading SCRA termination, uh, you're going to owe us back all the rebates we've given you. This was a big problem because you had E4 suddenly owing a landlord, you know, 2400 bucks they didn't have. This was kind of bad. Uh, it was particularly a problem in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, where they have, you know, just tons of landlords and, and tons of young uh, Navy folks who are coming in and out like crazy. And uh, they were really going after these kids, and uh, it, it was a huge problem. Fortunately, the Justice Department has stepped in and went after some of these landlords, and now it has is, is been made clear that the SCRA uh, uh, termination does, in fact, flat out terminate the lease. It is not an early termination. It is a termination period. It is, if, it, it is as if the lease has, has run its course through its normal course uh, and terminated on, on the SCRA date. It is not an, quote, early termination and so they can no longer demand back the rebates. Uh, there are other military clauses you should be aware of. Uh, some states have their own uh, mandatory military termination statutes. Uh, uh, Virginia is one of them. Unless you opt out, you get the military statute, their military statute. Uh, it, it has different terms than the SCRA, uh, which presents uh, Good news and bad news. Uh, I, if I'm representing a tenant and and looking for whichever one gives me the, my tenant the best deal, uh, and because uh, I'm usually trying to fix a problem my tenant caused by not giving proper notice, uh, but you should be aware whether your state has its own uh, SCRA-like termination statute, um, and uh, and be aware of that. The, the, state statute may be more advantageous than the federal SCRA, and, and you can kind of pick and choose which one to, which one to go after. Um, uh, but when the push comes to the shove, the Service Member Civil Relief Act is a federal statute. It's federally preemptive. In other words, it completely controls. So, uh, but with negotiation with the landlord, you know, you can try to use your state statute if that's more advantageous to your soldier. Uh, civilian tenant clauses, we talked a little bit about that already. Um, some some uh, leases have a civilian tenant clause that says that the, if the if the civilian uh, is, uh, is uh, terminates the lease if the employer moves them out of the area, um, it requires similar notice to uh, provisions, uh, but it usually involves a termination penalty. Uh, the landlord will very rarely let a civilian out of the lease without some kind of termination penalty. Uh, the typical ones I see are two months. Uh, so it's um, it, again, it's incumbent upon the tenant that if you need, if you know you need to go, uh, to get in touch with the landlord as soon as possible, and try to make sure that the uh, uh, you can negotiate your way out of this. Uh, notice, if you're reading through a typical lease, uh, there's going to be all kinds of things where it says the tenant shall give the landlord notice or the landlord shall give the tenant notice. Um, notice, 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 notice. Hopefully, the lease will say what notice means. They won't always, but most well-written, uh, certainly commercial leases, uh, will have a, a provision in there that says what, what good notice is. Uh, is it in writing? Um, does it need to be certified return receipt first class mail? Can it be hand delivery? Can it be commercial courier? 
Um, is there a, sort of a presumed receipt? Uh, is it effective when you put it in the mail? Is it effective three business days after mailing? You should know that um, because it may uh, depend on, you know, if, if you have to give a certain amount of notice in advance, uh, make sure you count those three days. Uh, more and more leases are starting to have things like email, uh, electronic transmissions, although I, I've seen a few, but it's not very common still uh, because emails can be not received, uh, texting can be unreliable uh, and easily missed. So you won't see electronic notice uh, very often, but, but it is kind of creeping in. Uh, young soldiers are texting their brains out and they think texting covers everything. Uh, it does not. Uh, but I text to him is not necessarily uh, uh, going to be a good defense. Uh, your state statute might have notice provisions and say what good notice is if you have a Landlord Tenant Act in your state. Uh, that certainly is uh, something to look at so you understand what your state says is notice. Some states now say electronic notice is okay. Um, other states have Landlord Tenant Acts that say act Actual receipt is okay. So it's with the notice provisions, but the landlord got the receipt and knows. Oh yeah, I know you told me you were moving out on the 25th, but you didn't send it certified return receipt. That's actual notice, and that might be good enough in your state. Uh, that's something you should know. But again, the the most uh, conservative uh, and way to deal with these things is, is do it by the letter. Uh, then you're not in fights over whether there's actual notice and whether, whether texting works and tweeting is sufficient and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, just, it's just not where you, it's not a fight you need to, to take on. Okay, move out inspections. Again, if you've done a perfect move-in inspection and you have a list of all the stuff that was wrong, uh, when you move out, uh, you should you should do just as diligent a a, a walkthrough. Um, I've had a lot of problems with landlords not wanting to do walk walkouts, move out inspections, or they want to schedule them after they know you've moved out and are already on your way to Oklahoma. Um, I think that's a trap, and you've got to be very careful with those. Um, do the best you can to get your landlord to walk through with you. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had people walk through and the landlord or the landlord's agent more likely has said things like, this is the cleanest house I've ever seen, and then the landlord sends the tenant a bill for you know $2,000 for damages. I, it, it happens and it's weird. Uh, but that's one reason why to try to get the walkthrough stuff in writing. Try to get the, the, the agent, if there is one, to sign something that says, this is the cleanest property I've ever seen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, um, then it makes it a little harder for the landlord to come back and say, oh, no, 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 there's all this terrible stuff that went on. Um, typically, this is done shortly after you move out, uh, the tenant moves out, uh, and it's going to determine whether you get the security deposit back or not, if you're the tenant. Um, some of the leases actually say what the move out obligations of the tenant are. If there is such provision in your lease uh, as a tenant, you should follow that. Uh, the tenant can be required to clean the premises professionally, not just you know run the vacuum around a little bit yourself. Uh, you got to return keys and garage openers and make sure all the filters are replaced and all the light bulbs are working. Uh, and you should be able to produce receipts that show the gutters have been professionally cleaned, the carpets have been professionally cleaned, the you know the flea and tick carpet treatment has been applied, uh, chimneys are clean, all that stuff. There should be receipts left with the landlord and uh, and you should keep a copy of those receipts. So there's, there's no question that that stuff has been done. Um, again, trying to get this stuff in writing is important. If for some reason the landlord won't, won't come or the property manager won't come, then um, again, video, photograph, video, photograph, write down, uh, be as critical as you can. Uh, do the best you can get the place cleaned up and um, and be ready to you know fight a battle another day if the landlord comes back and says oh there's all this stuff wrong again the best thing you can do is document 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 
uh, and that way you know uh, what's been done. And, and as a landlord, you should be doing this too. And I, I'm always concerned that landlords resist some of these um, um, efforts. It's, um, it, it would only be in the landlord's best interest to properly document a move in and a move out inspection. Uh, you know, that way everybody knows what's wrong and what had, what wasn't fixed and what was broken. And, and I, I find it odd that landlords tend to resist some of these. Um, uh, it would be easier on everybody if they were done correctly. Uh, somebody raised the issue before about property managers. Um, good news and bad news. The good news is you, proper, you have a property manager. The bad news is you have a property manager. Um, a lot of landlords come in to see me and they complain about their property managers. Um, they're not uh, responsive to the tenants. They're not responsive to the landlord. They're sending them statements that don't make any sense when they're collecting rent and you know doing stuff. And they feel like they're being overcharged for repairs. Um, a good property manager, I guess, is really hard to find. I've had a lot of landlords come in here complaining about property managers. Um, the, the big problem with property managers also is the contract the landlord may assign with the property manager. Uh, if you early terminate, you owe the, land, you owe the, the property manager uh, their commission for the remainder of the lease term that they got the, land, that they got the tenant for you. Uh, the, the contracts are difficult to get out of in that respect. Um, but a great property manager is a great property manager. Uh, they, they do the work for you while you're 500,000 half a globe away. Uh, if you don't have a good property manager, it can be very aggravating because you're 1,000 miles away and things are going wrong in Atlanta and your property manager isn't responsive to you and you've got to go there and fix it. Uh, that's annoying as a landlord. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, that's where some landlords wind up being is in a situation where the property manager um, is, is just not performing. Okay. Uh, somebody asked before about selling the premises. Uh, yes. Um, the um, landlord can sell the premises. Um, they can do that, uh, but typically, uh, so, and sometimes there's a there's a, a clause in the lease that says uh, what happens if the if the landlord sells the premises, um, what happens. Um, but typically, the new buyer takes subject to the lease, so you may have a new landlord. Um, I haven't seen that happen very much because most people buying a property don't want to buy it with someone in it. Uh, they want to buy it either to move into themselves or they want to put their own tenant in there uh, so they're not too keen on, on, on a property uh, that already has someone in it. Uh, we did for a while have a lot of problems with foreclosures of, of rental properties. Uh, that was especially true around here when everybody decided to get rich quick and the market was skyrocketing and people were paying outrageous amounts of money for houses, renting them, thinking that in two years they could flip them for double. Uh, and in fact, it went the other way. That a lot of people, the, the houses they bought for $300,000 were suddenly worth 150, and they went by way of foreclosure. And the, land, and the tenants were kind of um, shocked to find that their house was in foreclosure. Uh, and there was lots of lots of issues with those. Uh, fortunately, most of those have resolved now. We don't see that as commonly as we used to. But uh, but the answer is yes. The landlord can sell the property out from underneath you. Um, but you're not required to cooperate with that sale uh, unless you, unless you're in that window that your lease typically says you know 90 days before the expiration of your of your uh, tenancy. So there's some complications in that. Uh, someone has asked whether there's a property manager um, uh, certification body. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I don't know that there is. If there is, it would be state by state that they might require you to have a license to be a property manager. Um, a lot of property managers are real estate uh, have a real estate license um, that helps them with renting and and um, and uh, advertising and things like that. Um, it's it's really hard to say. I, you know, most people get their property manager through 
a word of mouth. Uh, you know, I use the ABC property management company, and they're great. You should use them too. Um, but uh, it's, you know, picking your and, – and, and I've had people, when I was convinced, said, look, this property manager was great for the first five years. Now he's terrible. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, so there's just some things you can't really predict. Um, it's um, it, probably the best thing to do is to, to read the contract. They give you very carefully. Uh, and understand exactly what it is they're going to do for you and what are they going to provide for you. Um, how responsive are they going to be? Do, do they use their own uh, maintenance people or not? Um, some of these companies use their own maintenance guys and they charge you as if they were they were using a commercial guy off the street. Uh, so, you know, those are questions you should ask. Um, uh, do, they have, do they have a real estate license? Do they have any other... Um, uh, they have references. Do they have people you can call and say, I'm a happy landlord. I've had this guy for 10 years. Uh, I think that's certainly fair game. How big are they? How many properties do they manage? Are they, you know, a mom and pop shop, but they manage 50 properties and they do it well? Or are they, you know, struggling to keep their nose above water and they really do, you know, only one or two? Uh, I don't know the answer. You know, these are things you'd have to ask. Uh, to see whether, whether you feel comfortable. Do they have a real office? Or do they run this out of their basement? Uh, is this a professional outfit or not? Uh, you know, so, some, and, and sometimes people just hire these people. They're 1,000 miles away, and they're hiring a total stranger. So uh, these, these can be very difficult uh, decisions to make uh, from a distance. Okay. For landlords, there, there are some tax issues that landlords should be aware of. Um, it's um, when they file their tax returns. It looks like Mary has had a minor connection issue, so we will hold tight for just a minute while she logs back in. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Uh, if you would like to take this opportunity, however, to type in any questions you may have uh, before we wrap up, please do so in the chat pod to the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Hi, Mary, are you back with us? Coming. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, I'm back. Yours. I'm sorry. It, 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 it dropped me into the netherworld there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you I'm back. Good. I'm back. All right, great. Thanks. Sorry, guys. Uh, fell off there on the end of the world. Um, okay, back to tax issues for landlords. So, uh, when you rent a property, one of the things you're supposed to do is depreciate it. And, and what the IRS has you do is take the value of the property on the date you, you put it in service, in other words, the date you first started renting it, and it's divided by, if I remember right, it's like 27 and a half, and that's your annual depreciation of the property. And you can take that, you can deduct that depreciation from whatever your earnings on that property are, so it lowers the amount of, of, of taxes that you pay. Um, um, and some people don't want to do it because they think it's too much math, but, you know, now with the software, it's pretty easy to do. So, but, you know, some people are like, I don't, I don't want to declare depreciation. Well, you should because it, it reduces your income, uh, and the IRS is going to treat you in the end as if you had taken that depreciation. So uh, have a good tax professional figure that out for you. It's important. Uh, but there's two things you have to be careful on if you sell the property. One of the things is called depreciation recapture which is all that depreciation that you took as a deduction against income all these years, well, what the IRS giveth, the IRS taketh back. Uh, the IRS is going to uh, recapture that depreciation from you. In other words, you're going to put it into a formula so you pay taxes on that. Uh, it's like a deferred uh, taxation. Uh, there's also capital gains issues if you're a landlord. Now, if you're a military landlord and you've lived in that property for two years over the last umpteen years, there's a formula you have to use uh, 
uh, for t the average uh, non-military person, you have to live in a property two or five years in order to avoid capital gains. That formula is very different for military people because they give you credit for times when you were when you were in, on active duty and not and stationed away from the property. Uh, it's it's complicated. I'm not going to go through that with you. Uh, you'll be you know dropping off the face of the earth on me. It'd be so boring. But if you look at IRS Pub 3, if you really want to learn how to do that stuff, again, if you know a landlord or if you are a landlord and you are looking at um, at uh, selling the property. Uh, go see a tax professional in advance if you can, um, and um, and 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 find out what you owe. Uh, I remember I had one client who uh, had his taxes done and was furious that he owed like seven thousand uh, dollars, and didn't have it because he'd put everything he made from selling the rental property into his new home as a down payment, uh, and had no idea this stuff existed, uh, and that he was going to have to pay. Uh, Appreciation, recapture, and capital gains. Um, big surprise there. So, uh, anyone who's selling a rental property, uh, you know, go see your tax professional and make them do the math for you, so you can set aside enough of the proceeds of the sale to um, to make sure you're covered. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions, folks? I, I kind of gave you the broad sweep here, um, but if any of you all have other questions, I'm happy to field. Um, and um, other than that, thanks for having me. It was fun. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mrs. Benzinger. Um, if any of you have questions, please feel free to add them to the chat pod while we have a few minutes left in here. I want to direct you to the different ways you can con get in touch with the Military Families Learning Network online, on Facebook, Twitter, and through our podcast and on YouTube. And this webinar is approved for one and a half CEUs for AFCs and CPFCs. We ask that you complete the evaluation and then you'll be directed to a 10 question quiz. If you pass that with 10, 80% uh, or higher, you'll be emailed a certificate of completion that you can exchange for your CEUs. And we ask that you'll join us and mark on your calendar our next webinar in the Permanent Change of Station series on April 2nd, Research and Tools for support, Supporting Military Transitions. You can RSVP through the link shown on the screen here. I'm going to mute myself so Dr. Gillen can ask a question that was asked in the chat pod. It looks like Dr. Gillen's audio is a bit lagging at this moment, Molly if you'd like to chime in. All right, I'm going to assume I was, the chat pod was moving so fast while I was talking. Is it Jacqueline's question here? Um, should one consider the tax rules if you retired and then sell the rental property, although when you purchased sorry, the chat pod keeps me, you purchased the property, you were still on AD. Ms. Benzinger, do you want to address that? Yes, I will. I'm working on Bruce right now. Um, uh, Bruce had asked, what, uh, how about people who are in the military and rent out other, another house in another state? Uh, the answer is you pay taxes no matter what. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're uh, what state you're in, uh, the, you're going to pay the federal taxes on that, and, and that federal income transfers over to your state um, tax return. Uh, if, if, if you do, if you if you're liable for state uh, tax return, um, Jacqueline asked, uh, should one consider the tax rules if you've retired and then sell the rental property, even though you purchased the property while you're still on active duty? Uh, yes, Jacqueline, you should have someone take a look at it, because while you were on active duty, uh, you may have extended out that five-year period, and now that you've come off of orders, you, some of that may still apply. Like I said, this stuff gets really complicated as to, as to as to how much of your active duty may have given you an extension on those five years. Again, uh, a, a good tax professional could figure that out for you.
thank you so much. That was great. This has been a fantastic webinar. I thank Ms. Benzinger for her expertise today, and I thank all of you for joining us. And I will turn things over to Coral Owen. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Molly. I just would like to echo Molly's thanks. Uh, and Mary, thank you so much for your time and expertise today, as well as to all of uh, you who participated in the chat pod with questions and insightful comments. We so appreciate your uh, contributions as well. I would like to let everyone know that in addition to professional development opportunities in the area of personal finance, we also cover a host of other areas uh, that tie directly into the personal finance world, including military fa uh, caregiving, family development, family transitions, nutrition and wellness, network literacy, and community capacity building. So if you'd like to explore more about these other options, you're welcome to explore them at militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org. So we will go ahead and keep the room open for a couple more uh, moments in case you need to collect any last minute information or links from the chat pod. Uh, of course, if you have any follow up questions, you can contact Molly for uh, questions regarding this session or personal finance CEUs, mollyh2 at extension.org. Thanks, Molly. And we do wish you a wonderful afternoon if you're headed out. And we hope to see you again at another MFLN opportunity in the near future. Yvonne, regarding the post-test and certificate, or uh, pardon me, the post-test and evaluation, there's no phrase. Uh, you should just be able to access the post-test and eval via that link, and we can repost it to the chat pod too if that's more convenient.